So uh, good afternoon and welcome to webinar two of three on energy efficient facilities during COVID-19. My name is Jeff Crawford. I am the managing principal of Ross and Berzini's higher education research market sector, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. Today, we're going to focus on building operations during the COVID-19 pandemic. With me are three experts on the topic from Ross and Berzini, John Biggs, Michael Steinle, and J.R. Simmons. John Biggs is a senior mechanical engineer and commission agent for Ross and Berzini. John has 24 years of experience in the HVAC industry. He cut his teeth in the industry at consultant engineering firm, then worked as a building automation controls programmer, followed by positions in facility engineering and operations at two local St. Louis landmark campuses, the Missouri Botanical Garden and Washington University. He has now come full circle and has been working again as a consulting engineer at Ross and Berzini. Michael Steinle has over 30 years of experience in emergency preparedness, resilience, and environmental health and safety stewardship. Michael served as the technical lead in developing pandemic response plans on behalf of Santa Clara County Public Health Department, as well as state level plans in two states. In 2010, Michael served as the planning coordinator on the FEMA Region 7 New Madrid Seismic Zone Catastrophic Earthquake Plan and received a commendation from the FEMA Region 7 Administrator. Michael has led multidisciplinary teams in facilitating, facilitating community resiliency in a variety of critical infrastructure sectors, including agriculture and food, chemical, defense, higher education, healthcare, and public health, transportation, and water. Michael is an accomplished author and researcher and has conducted over 250 discussion and operations-based emergency exercises. J.R. Simmons has over 40 years of experience and is a principal consultant within the Communications Technology Division of Ross and Berezini with expertise in complex networks, UC collaboration solutions, multimedia call centers, and both wired and wireless infrastructure. He teaches current and developing technology telecommunications classes, is a frequent public speaker, a regular contributor to the independent industry websites, No Jitter and BC Strategies, and he is a past president of the Society of Communications Technology Consultants, or SCTC. With those introductions behind us, let's get on with the questions for our panel. Question one is for John Biggs. I understand one of the most effective measures at reducing the risk of virus transmission through HVAC operations is increasing the level of ventilation air to dilute the concentration of the virus in the air. How can this be accomplished with existing systems without driving up energy costs or making systems space is uncomfortable. Well, Jeff, ASHRAE does recommend increasing the ventilation rates. And uh, as uh, many of us in the industry are aware of that uh, treating ventilation outdoor air is more expensive than treating a, a recirculated air, uh, except when you're using economizer mode when temperatures are lower. So if it's warm outside, there's really no way to avoid that it is going to cost you more to ventilate more. And with that in mind, what we recommend is, is uh, doing an energy audit of your buildings and trying to uncover some offsetting things that you can do to recover that cost. Uh, that might include lighting upgrades, using occupancy schedules, modifying your se sequence of controls to uh, optimize boiler and chiller plants, and that kind of thing. If you have significant unoccupied areas of your building, of course, there are strategies there where you can minimize the energy used for temperature control and still try to protect your building from uh, the uh, risk of mold growth. Very good. Question number two is also for you, John. Can a higher level of filtration within HVAC systems also provide a benefit? If so, is HEPA filtration required or can a lower level of filtration that causes less impact to pressure drop and fan energy consumption be uh, included? Or be effective. Yeah, you can actually reduce viral count at filter grades below HEPA. Uh, the virus, uh, specifically COVID, that is associated with uh, our respiratory system tends to be associated with the moisture that human beings expel when they speak or when they cough. And this moisture uh, has, uh, encourages the virus to bind to uh, particulate matter, dust, if you will, in the atmosphere, which makes it easier to filter. So uh, ASHRAE has recommended MERV 13 or the highest grade filter that is compatible with the filter rack and then sealing around the edges of the filter to uh, prevent bypass. Uh, another way to inactivate the virus uh, separate from filtering is to use uh, UV lighting. 
Thanks, John. Well, that leads to question number three, which I'm going to direct to Michael Steinle. As John mentioned, UVC lighting has proven to effectively kill the virus. In addition to UVC lighting, what other options do facility owners have for disinfecting their buildings? Thank you, Jeff. Um, well, just uh, talk a little bit about UVC. Uh, ultraviolet's impact on, on microbes is well established. Uh, according to the National Academy of Sciences, UV light is probably effective as a disinfection tool for coronaviruses. Um, and a specific class of UVC light or UV light, UVC destroys uh, genetic material or uh, ribonucleic acid in this case, uh, which inactivates a coronavirus. In contrast, though, uh, there's no evidence at this point that typical sun exposure can deactivate the coronavirus. So it really has to be that UVC uh, range of, of ultraviolet, ultraviolet light to, to effectively uh, to disinfect uh, for co coronavirus. Um, it should be pointed out that, though, that no published peer-reviewed studies to date have looked specifically at the effect of UV light uh, on the coronavirus, although it has been tested on uh, a couple of other coronaviruses, MERS and SARS. So um, it's it's pretty likely that UVC will work on, on uh, COVID-19. Um, factors to consider in using UVC light as a disinfectant include time and distance from the surface or the medium being disinfected. Um, the manufacturer's uh, recommendations should indicate specific parameters for using UVC light as a disinfectant. And if they don't, it's probably not a, a uh, very well studied uh, technology and you know, a lot of this stuff is coming out fairly quickly so you want to if you use one use UVC light you want to you want to use one that's been thoroughly tested um, as for for use in, in air ducts and HVAC systems uh, uh, as indicated previously ASHRA provides guidelines for UVC light uh, with respect to time airflow and other factors um, they are uh, UVC systems are currently in use in salons and hotels and public transit systems. Uh, I know they're being tested in New York City and the subway system. So there, there's a lot of uh, data yet to be collected on it, and I'm sure we'll learn more about it as time goes. Some of the cons about UVC light is, uh, uh, with respect to, to uh, use on humans, um, that UVC light causes severe sunburns and, and uh, retinal damage. So it's not an effective or it's not, it's not useful for, for human disinfection. It should only be used on objects or surfaces. Um, and the, the World Health Organization and CDC have, have uh, uh, devised some, some uh, standards uh, uh, indicating you know, use on surfaces. Uh, UV, UVC or UV light in general should not be used as a hand sanitizer stick to soap and water, alcohol-based uh, sanitizers. Um, uh, as far as the research horizon goes, uh, there's a, a PhD, uh, David Brenner, working uh, at the Center for Radiological Research at Columbia University. He's doing some uh, studies on narrow band UV light called VAR UVC that can kill viruses without getting through living skin cells. So there's some hope there that uh, maybe uh, they could be used that UV that far UVC light could be used in in occupied settings. Um, moving on from from UVC, some of the other process considerations include, um, in addition to, to UVC disinfection for for uh, uh, functions for uh, materials, other processes to consider include, you know, obviously traditional disinfection. And there's lots of information about about that on, on the CDC uh, websites. Hand washing, of course, we've talked about a lot. We've heard a lot about that from Dr. Fauci and others. Um, mask policies, uh, we see we're seeing more mandates for that across the country at the state and local levels. Um, of course, distancing, uh, alternate occupancy, multi, uh, multiple class periods or shifts, or remote tasking as, are things that can be done. The two things that are, are a little more public health centric that um, you've probably heard about, but um, uh, haven't been widely implemented yet are health screening. Um, you know, absent viral specific testing, there are some things you can do to evaluate whether or not somebody might be exposed or infected. Uh, temperature checks, pulse oximetry is another, another good thing, measures your saturated oxygen level, which is impacted by coronavirus. And there are other factors used to, to do health screening, um, which is 
appropriate in a in an employment setting where that you've got a captured audience you want to keep you want to keep uh, from being infected and, and infecting one another. The last issue here is, is contact tracing. You know, once you've figured out that um, somebody, that a group of people haven't been exposed and, and aren't infected, in order to keep them from getting infected, contact tracing can be a good, a good tool to use to, to make sure that if somebody is out and exposed that they don't um, come in contact with some of the other employees or groups of folks or students as it were. So uh, those are some of the other policy issues and, and processes to consider. Thank you, Michael. You so question four is for J.R. Simmons. Uh, there's been a lot of emphasis placed on HVAC operations and cleaning operations and combating COVID-19, but it would seem that another aspect of building operations that will become very important as people practice social distancing, particularly on university campuses, is the bandwidth and coverage of a building's wireless system that will allow occupants to access virtual meetings and classroom sessions remotely without being in the same room with others. How does a building owner assess their wireless system and what measures can be taken to address shortcomings? Thanks, Jeff. So I think almost everybody's aware there's been a explosion in virtual business meetings and virtual classroom sessions and things like that. Uh, what we're talking about now though is how it impacts the usage patterns how people are dispersed, the, the dispersion of access, and those simultaneous demands that are increasing so much, especially if you're looking at, for example, on a campus in a residential hall, where even though they're on campus, instead of all of them going to class at once with the associated issues we've talked about, uh, some of them taking class from their own room. Well, now you are looking at room situations, uh, dormitories, whatever, that have to be optimized for this real-time communications, because real-time communications is much more sensitive than just streaming a video or even uh, a, a casual interaction on the web. Uh, certainly, the standard browsing and everything else does not place the same stress on a system that you will when you're trying to take a class. You need to hear all the words. You need to see all the images. You need to see uh, the two-way capabilities in a lot of cases have to be in place. And most Wi-Fi systems have been built more for convenience than for critical communications. And that's where we're seeing a big change. So to reassess, it's not just throwing more access points at it. More access points can actually make it worse than better. What really needs to be done is taking the design that exists and reevaluating it with this new uh, parameters around usage and simultaneous access, real-time communications, leveraging the latest technologies that are available, and then not just do it as a snapshot at one point, uh, but then adjusting as traffic patterns change because you're going to see uh, situations where fluctuations in the day, in the week, uh, and, and just the volume of traffic will not match a generic design. So uh, things like dynamic controllers can help, and there's also some new technologies coming out uh, based upon new frequencies that have been assigned. So the Wi-Fi band, for example, is being expanded as of April. Uh, the FCC is allocating an additional 1,200 uh, megahertz uh, in the 6 gigahertz band immediately above the current 5 gigahertz band that we're familiar with, with Wi-Fi. So an assessment really needs to take all these factors into, into place, and it can't just be a single design based upon building layout. It really should be looked at with an eye toward what is the actual usage, which means you can do a preliminary design based upon anticipated levels, uh, the layout of the building where people would probably be concentrated and or dispersed. But then after the usage actually begins, it's probably necessary in most situations to then keep an eye on that. Uh, whereas the dynamic controllers can help some, actual design is still based upon what we'll call field situations, what's actually going on in the field. There's also probably an important note that when we talk Wi-Fi is only one element of wireless, there's also been a big growth in pairing those technologies up with Bluetooth and cellular and a few other wireless technologies, not just for access to uh, classroom situations or meetings, but even for some other things like using your cell phone to open your door so it's contactless and things that we're starting to see in the, uh, the hotel, motel uh, type industries where they're trying to find a way to reduce the amount of uh, devices that have to actually be passed around. Well, that's uh, one of the things we're starting to see more of as well. Excellent. So, JR, you know, given that, will, you know, will there be time to upgrade a building's Wi-Fi system before, if at universities, before this fall semester starts? 
The short answer is yes, if people hop on it right now and if they get the right tools and the right uh, assessments going. Like I said, it's not as simple as just throwing a, a few extra access points out there and guessing that it's going to be good. So it does take an actual assessment, not just a um, uh, circles on a page. Uh, well, here's here's where we think it'll cover based upon so many feet. Things like building construction uh, and usage of the of the different systems, what they expect for true performance, all is going to factor in. So a really good design needs to take all those things in, and it does take a little bit of time, but we have time if we hop on it right now, and if you do it with the right tools. Uh, it also depends upon, are we talking about you know six uh, dorms and or residential halls or 36? I mean, there's obviously uh, uh, every building does need to be assessed slightly uh, independently of everything else, even though there may be some commonalities or overlap because of the unique situations. So the short answer is yes, there's time, but it's not the thing you can wait until two weeks before uh, you're ready to use it and say, well, let, let's tweak it now. And as I mentioned, after it's set up, it's probably important to come back in after a couple of weeks of, uh, of usage to see what has changed from modeling. Very good. Thanks, JR. Uh, John, John, getting back to the comment about UVC lighting, and uh, Michael mentioned some, some uh, an option of putting it in the HVAC system. So what options do exist for installing UVC lighting in HVAC equipment and duct work, and, and how effective will that be? So UVC is a very uh, developed and accepted technology for doing uh, airstream sterilization that's been in place in uh, research and uh, hospital environments for quite some time. Uh, I think from our for our viewers, what is important to convey here, though, is that many of them are probably familiar with the usage of UVC to prevent uh, mold on uh, cooling coils and to keep slime, I guess, from uh, growing in condensate pans. And uh, the critical thing here is that that requires a lot less intensity of UVC light than on the fly virus kill. Uh, because the UVC light in those applications are constantly shining upon the surface. Whereas when you're passing an airstream through a UVC light, uh, the time that the virus is receiving that UVC light can be limited. So there are, it requires a higher intensity. It also requires a minimum residency time in the light. So to properly apply this, you have to look at the ductwork dimensions. You have to consider the air velocity so that you, uh, and which impacts the length of duct that you need to install the lighting in so that you get enough residency time and enough UVC intensity to kill the virus on the fly. Uh, so it's all very doable. It's been done in the past. Uh, just again, want to caution that it is not just as simple as getting a UVC light bulb on a socket and shining, shining it on the cooling coil and the condensate pan as uh, many installed systems currently have. Great. Thanks, John. So with that, I'd like to open, open the, the floor up to questions from our audience. Okay, the first question we have here is, will it be safe for me to send my daughter to live in her dorm this fall? <laughs> Michael, you want to you want to you want to take that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, I, the answer is, of course, it it depends. Um, it's important to check the school's policies and procedures. Uh, many schools are going to online only and uh, lab and other hands-on courses only uh, being uh, attended in person. Um, that's a, a, a pretty good approach if you're, particularly if you're in an area where there's a significant uh, outbreak going on right now. Others are trying to distance students in classes. Uh, I know there's some, in my hometown, there's some, some frantic uh, uh, measures being taken to, to distance the school, to distance kids in the classroom. Uh, and, and I know they're gonna have mask policies as well. That's probably a pretty important one to monitor too. Um, you know, some, some level of enforcement of masks with, you know, without being too Machiavellian about it, I think is important. And it's probably a good idea to find out what the policy is for students that test positive. 
you know, it's going to happen. There's going to be, you know, if you got 30,000 students, you're going to have some positive tests and it's good to know what, what, what happens with, with those students and where they, you know, how, how they get treated and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing I would say, just speaking as a parent, is it's also important for the student to have a plan to maintain social distance on their own too. And, you know, stick to a known group of friends kind of makes some sense if you think about it, having masks and staying healthy beyond COVID-19, generally healthy people who contract the virus uh, typically fare much better. So um, there's, it, it, I would look at the policies at the school and, and then, you know, kind of have my own plan. Yeah, and I, I would add to that, you know, we, we design a lot of student housing facilities and, and some are more inherently better than others in terms of just providing that separation between students. Uh, for instance, a residence hall that has a suite configuration where there's three or four students to a, a bathroom and have their own private bathroom is, is going to result in more isolation from each other than a, a residence hall with traditional bedrooms and community bathrooms where there's much more opportunity for the students to come in contact with each other. So those are uh, those are some other items to consider in terms of the residence hall your, your, your child is living in. Okay, what other questions do we have here? So John, getting back to the, uh, the dilution topic, there was a question about uh, uh, you know, reducing the pop, if the population of a building is reduced from a normal occupancy, wouldn't that in effect increase the dilution of the ventilation air in the building? Well, if you have fewer occupants, you have more ventilation per occupant. And so uh, theoretically that should uh, decrease, you know, viral uh, concentrations. Uh, personally, I think uh, you still want to look at increasing ventilation just to get the increased building flush effect, which is uh, to get that flushing through the system. You know, that's independent of the number of occupants except of course if you have a high occupancy the more of that flushing you want to to have occur you know one other thing i i would i would add to that is is a lot of uh, large central air handling systems have economizer operation and perhaps stretching out that uh, that period of time in which during which you're operating economizer mode uh, even though there may be a slight energy penalty if it's uh uh if you're operating that when outside air conditions are slightly higher than, than indoor, your, if your system has the capacity to handle that and properly cool and dehumidify or heat that air, you could effectively provide more ventilation air without affecting the comfort within the building. Though I would add there would be a slight energy penalty for doing so. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right, Jeff, because usually the cutoff point for economizer mode is determined by energy efficiency. Uh, so yes, absolutely. You could run your economizer at beyond the usual set points if you're willing, if your system has the ability to uh, apply the required energy to treat the air, certainly. Okay, uh, looking to see if we have any more questions from our audience. We have a few in there about the UVC lights. See those, Jeff? I see one about a UVC okay. light robot. Yes. There's a question. Could a UVC light robot be used to disinfect an office prior to a work day? Yeah, so there are actually uh, UVC uh, devices now that are made that are designed to treat a room. Essentially, this is a, a bunch of high intensity UVC bulbs put on a three, six, 360 degree uh, fixture and you put it in the middle of the room, you clear all the human beings out and you press the button and uh, takes about 15 minutes to sterilize, you know, a, a couple of hundred square foot room. Now these units cost, uh, from what I've seen, five, six thousand uh, dollars. If I was a university, I might consider purchasing one though. You know, if, uh, if you had a, a positive test result in a room, I'm sure all the roommates would feel real, uh, get a, a much better, if you pardon the phrase, warm, fuzzy feeling out of having that light rolled into their room and disinfecting it, uh, you know, after their comrade is, has moved somewhere else. 
different. There day. are also we've we know some a couple of airports are testing uh, robots in the terminal areas in the public areas that um, just kind of like a Roomba. They go through the whole terminal and and disinfect certain um, surfaces. Uh, the the downside to those is you can imagine they're they're pretty expensive, but um, they do they have been proven to work. Absolutely. So we have another question here. Uh, can the UVC light be installed where the HVAC filters are located and will that be more effective? So as I mentioned uh, prior, the, the key things are residency time in the light and enough light intensity. So anywhere that you can accomplish those two factors. Uh, one advantage to the filter section is usually it's designed for a little bit lower air velocity uh, so that the pre so that the pressure drop doesn't affect the filter as much, or so the filter doesn't uh, adversely affect your pressure drop. Uh, so that's possible. Uh, keep in mind, if you're doing that, you definitely want to get it on the, you know, in the return air stream. It doesn't do you a whole, whole lot of good to disinfect the outdoor air stream because it's already theoretically pretty darn clean. Uh, so you want to, you want to look at that. All right. We have a question here. Is there, uh, do we have any information about FAR UVC light? Well, the, um, as I said, the, there's some research going on at Columbia University. Um, it, so it is really truly in research mode. And, and I think it'll, it'll take a little bit of time to test whether or not um, uh, the safety factors there for use while occupied. Um, so similar to what we talked about with lights, you know, to being turned on at, at this point, you clear the room and, and turn the lights on and, and disinfect without anybody in there. The hope with Dr. Brenner at, at Columbia is that uh, using this 222 nanometer uh, far UVC uh, system that you wouldn't have to clear the room. It's safe. It wouldn't cause uh, any health problems for humans. But um, again, the research is, is still going on and, and it's got to go through FDA approval before it could be used in, in uh, general purposes. So there's a little bit of time lag here before that's going to be ready, I'm afraid. Understood. Okay, we have another question here. For new construction, what is the possibility or benefit of designing more localized zone systems, i.e. more air handlers, for example, floor by floor systems that use outside air for fewer occupants, or maybe by tenant space. John, you want to res respond to that? Sure, I'll take that. Uh, the more zoning you have, the, the more uh, the more occupant comfort you have, and the more ability you have to run some some spaces in an occupied mode and other spaces in an unoccupied mode. So certainly, with uh, a lot of the uh, companies that we've seen. Uh, are looking at a phased reopening where they may be only opening portions of the building or, you know, going to a three shift uh, type of, of operation. So certainly the more zoning you have in place, uh, the more energy, the more economical efficiency you can have in running that system. And also for the potential of isolating various parts of the building. If you have someone, you know, a few people come a positive in a particular wing of the building, you might want to be able to flush that system independent of other systems in the building. So I could certainly see going forward, you know, if uh, the, vaccine, the vaccine development attempt that we're on, you know, that is underway, if that lags longer than a lot of folks are hopeful, you know, and we have to begin to adjust to this new reality over the long term, I would certainly encourage folks to be looking at more localized zoning and building more uh, flexibility into their into their systems. Well, and I would add to that, John. It's 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 been shown that it is more difficult to uh, spread the virus through a building through the HVAC systems in terms of return air and recirculating. But certainly, once through air systems, do have less potential uh, or eliminate the potential, I should say, for spreading a virus to other parts of a building. So for instance, that residence hall example I mentioned earlier, if we have dedicated outdoor air systems supplying outside air and exhausting air from rooms and we're circulating fan clients within the room, there's really no air being recirculated to other 
rooms or other suites or other parts of the building where their occupants are. And buildings, uh, other buildings, classroom, office buildings that have chill beams, for instance, that use uh, dedicated outside air to uh, supply ventilation air to the active chill beams, but don't recirculate air to other parts of the buildings. They're certainly going to be uh, safer from a, a virus spread standpoint than those, than traditional uh, VAV recirculating systems that take that air and spread it to other parts of the building. I think that might have been where the question was going. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, those are certainly, I think there could be a, a move toward more systems like that that uh, do have an energy benefit as well, particularly with a, a chill beam system with minimal uh, ventilation air. We should also think about the fact that we're addressing this particular pandemic. This isn't the last pandemic that will come around. They're already making noise about the next version of swine flu or something. So uh, going to the point of a new building design, uh, it may not be uh, built in time to make a difference on COVID-19, but it may make a difference in future uh, is situations of a similar nature. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's part of why you're seeing even universities are, are opening their labs to students or planning to open their labs to students this fall uh, because those are also once through air systems where there is an air recirculated other parts of the building. There's a lot of dilution, uh, which we, we talked earlier is effective. There's usually a higher level of filtration and the air is not recirculated to other parts of the building. So from an HVAC standpoint, a lab building is fairly uh, safe in terms of recirculating the virus to other parts of a building. Yep, I agree. Okay, well, I, it appears we have, we have reached our 30-minute our time limit for this webinar. I uh, appreciate uh, our panel for participating, and uh, thank you, audience, for your great questions. Hopefully we provided a little information today that will help you uh, as you look at your facilities and, and how, you, how you're gonna operate them in uh, the face of this COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, future opportunities to discuss these uh, issues and topics with you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Jeff. Bye-bye. Thank